Oh, there's a show I was going to mention to you, and you might want to check it out and see where we go with it. My friend Wayne, who died last week, I went to see him last Saturday, and he we were talking about scary shows and everything, and he, I mentioned that we had seen Train to Busan. He asked me if I'd ever seen Dementia 13, and I said, no, what is that? Well, apparently, it is the first long-range, long-term movie done by Francis Ford Coppola, done in 1965 66 and it's just a you know he said real scary movie so i said hmm mm-hmm. i've never i've never heard of it before so i went online looked at looked up a little bit of it and um looks kind of interesting black and white um mid 60s yeah and apparently the first uh, coppola movie he had done short things before that like little short uh, i don't wouldn't call them movies but little short vignettes or whatever but this is the first first movie he made and it's a supposedly a scary movie that's all i know about it nice yeah we'll add it to the list i mean i'll, I'll be in for that for sure now let me just uh take a step back you said he died your friend wayne yeah yeah he had cancer oh okay i was gonna say so that's why you went to see him because otherwise it just yeah, it seems if you just went to see him and you're chatting about movies and then he just dropped yeah, well, in. Well, you know, we were just, he, his wife was there. We were just talking about various things and, you know, he, yeah, he had, was on the MAID program. So medically, yeah, well, just same as, same as Neil. I think we have no choice. Then we have to watch that movie. It's the dead man's last wish <laughs> that we watch this film. No offense, Wayne. I'm only laughing because death is creepy. Anything that he uh, he had ever usually recommended to me was really, really good. So uh, I was just surprised I'd never heard of this before. Yeah, neither have I. So, yeah, I'll add it to the list. So I guess that's a good, uh, we can just roll right in from there. Speaking of, speaking of horror movies. So, yeah, we watched uh, Train to Busan because I'm visiting Busan and uh, I'm pretty sure it's the most famous Busan movie. I never, I mean, everyone's heard of Seoul, but I had never really heard of Busan until that movie. So we had to check our previous episodes for details if you want to know what we thought about that movie, but it was pretty cool. And then basically that movie was quite famous and made a lot of money and did quite well. And there's this sequel that, again, I haven't done a ton of research yet. I think it's kind of better to just watch it first and then we can see what trivia pops up afterward because I'd rather go in not knowing. But all I do know is, at least and I could be wrong about this too, but I guess this it came out a few years after and it also takes place a few years after. So presumably, Korea is uh, infested with zombies, and because uh, they insinuated pretty heavily in the first one that Busan is the only city that wasn't completely overrun. And it seemed from the deer that they showed in the first one that it's not just people, it's also animals that get zombified, so that would make it extra hard to defend any, you know, especially a, a mountainous country like, like Korea that's full of uh, nature and stuff. So I guess this one takes place further into the epidemic, and uh, and all I know is it just wasn't as well received because I think there's a you know it's a lot cleaner to have the zombie uprising you know that's a pretty simple, easy to follow plot where, you know we talked a lot last time about Dawn of the Dead it's kind of one of those situations it's like all right we're a few years into the uh, epidemic now what do you do you got to come up with a different plot, and as you were saying like. Night of the Living Dead is much more a straight-up horror. Dawn of the Dead is like a weird satire. They had to come up with a different angle. So uh, what is this one called? It's called Peninsula. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll just see. I guess we'll see how they followed up Train to Busan. Well, they'll have a pretty hard act to follow, but they might do it. They, they might they might pull it off and do a really good job. But Train to Busan, I, I, I'll say again, it, it's one of the best zombie movies that I've ever seen. Yeah, and I guess the only other thing I noted about it, but it, it is important to note, is uh, luckily this movie came out, I believe it came out in 2020. So, you know, they filmed it in 2019, right before COVID, because, uh, man, that was an awkward few years for many reasons, but uh, you can really feel it in movies. Like, you can tell when you watch movies from COVID times, where all of a sudden things are just filmed differently and it's like hmm i'm not quite sure if those people are even in the same room together the way this is shot or uh, suddenly outdoor scenes and big crowd scenes are all mysteriously absent for two or three years in movies and uh it's safe to say that i mean the whole claim to fame in in a way of train to busan the way they approached zombies 
is like with the super packed in everyone lives on top of each other very dense population stuff that happens in asia that's the way they did zombies it was like a flood it was like the zombies were like water so i don't know that they'd be able to film a movie of this type while covid was going on but luckily this movie came out right before just in time so we won't have to worry <laughs> about that but it certainly expressed that message that People finally woke up during COVID and said, my God, we are living too on top of each other. We are living too crowded to each other. We're able to spread a virus like just by being close to somebody. And that movie, yeah, really, strangely enough, yeah, just came out just before COVID. But I mean, that that message should have been known to the world forever, especially in the last century. But it people just kind of ignored it until we actually had a virus and people did die from it. All those zombie movies, that basically their premise is like, uh, yeah, we're all too close and we can spread whatever so easily. And then it happened. I do wonder what it would have been like. I mean, the extreme example is, you know, here in South Korea or in Japan or something like, what would that have been like? But because we were in Atlantic Canada during all that time, it was like shockingly easy for us. You know, I mean, I, I was mildly inconvenienced because the coffee shops weren't open but my day-to-day -day life just didn't change because our population like i always describe my hometown where you are right now it feels like a movie back lot but when they're not using it you know <laughs> like the streets are just kind of empty like literally if you during even the peak of covid like if i saw somebody walking down the street toward me i could just cross the street and not be even remotely near them <laughs> you know <laughs> like you never even had to worry about being too close to people where even if we were just in a in Toronto, like my Toronto friends were way stressed out. And if we were in like New York, it'd be really bad. And then if you were out here, like I can't even imagine what that must have been like. Just today I was packed into a train like a sardine. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just glad I didn't have to do that, I guess. And I know you see those street scenes, especially in movies. New York is famous for it. They'll show street scenes and the sidewalks are just packed like side to side with people. You very rarely see a scene where there are no people or very few people on the street unless it's a night scene. But during the day, yeah, they're, they're, they're packed. Yeah, so what do you do? Like, you can't cross the street because you've got six lanes of traffic. And if you did cross the street, big deal. It's the same over there. Yeah, I remember, because, uh, you know, even like by city standards, nowadays I don't consider Montreal very crowded, you know. It's a pretty, pretty easy breezy feeling city. But compared, again, to just a small, small city in Atlantic Canada, I remember visiting Montreal, and it was the first time that I was walking down the street, and I had some other thought or something, and I stopped walking, and somebody bumped into me. And that had never happened to me once in my life, because why would the person be right behind me? But it only had to happen once, and then I realized, like, oh, when I'm not in a, a tiny city take a little glance behind you before you stop walking. If you just stop walking all of a sudden, somebody else might walk right into you. <laughs> and I'd never had that experience before. And it was like, oh crap, this is what it's like when it's people live somewhere. That was what was so different about when we go back to the crowds and Night of the Living Dead. It was in a country, whereas you get trained to Busan and it was in a very, very crowded city. So you had to have all those people on the set and have them all trying to chase each other and bite each other. But night of the in most zombie movies that you see, there's they're in fairly packed population areas. But Night of the Living Dead was not. That was in the country. I mean, there were stories you heard all over the radio of them saying in such and such a place, this was happening, a crowded place. But the actual setting for Night of the Living Dead was very, very rural. And yet there were a fair number of people <laughs> roaming around doing the zombie thing. Yeah, it definitely was a different vibe. Like, if I remember right, the famous, they're coming to get you, Barbara. Wasn't it just one one zombie in the cemetery? Yeah, yeah, yes. And they're at the cemetery yeah, visiting whoever had died, I forget. And it's very it's very isolated. But yet there there are quite a few of them who come out of the woodwork wherever they came from in this rural area and attack that farmhouse where they all are at the end of the day. It was different. Yeah. Yeah, a different premise for, for that kind of movie. Again, yeah, that well was actually, movie. 
Yeah, it was actually really cool now that I think back of like, yeah, how it started off so, so small. And yeah, it's just the, the zombies keep slowly making their way toward the house and it gets worse and worse. Where, yeah, definitely these Busan movies are uh, pedal to the metal instead. It's like instantly it's a complete zombie catastrophe. But in its own way, that's cool too. And that's kind of, I guess, the thing I'm most interested in is, uh, you know, hopefully the plot of this will be interesting, whatever it happens to be. But just to see the world, just to see what happens to the world, because that was the neatest thing about the Romero movies also, is Dawn of the Dead, you know, it had spread across America, Day of the Dead, you couldn't even go above ground anymore because things were so bad, Land of the Dead, there was at least one city that was kind of back to normal, things were kind of, you know, <laughs> zombies were finally chilling out a little. So, I mean, that's always interesting, too, like, with these sequels. It's like, yeah, maybe they'll be good, maybe they'll be bad, but it's just neat to see what's going to happen deeper into the timeline. How does the world adapt to zombies? So, uh, if for nothing else, I think this will be neat to see that. Let's just see. They're usually quite successful if they try to develop the initial premise. It's when they just regurgitate the original, and, and there's so much of that just regurgitation of what you already saw that to me is when they, you know, they need to give up. But if they're if they're continuing to develop it and show what happens in the future, and it's different than what the original was, okay, hey, fair game, go for it. But when you get some of these ones that just kind of keep regurgitating it over and over and over again, those Freddy movies, for example, oh, good God, <laughs> yeah. give it up. I was up. just going to say. <laughs> I was going to say the Jason movies, but the same thing. Yeah, the where Jason like, movies, yeah, all of them. Zombies are at least, they're, they're a process. So yeah, they're well suited to like, let's see where this is going to go. Where with Jason movies, man, it's really clear when you look back in hindsight, they always thought each one was going to be the last one. They never had a plan for the future. So uh, it got more and more tenuous <laughs> as things went on. But that's kind of fun in its own crappy way too. But, but it's neat too. I kind of like that even though Train to Busan was such a big hit. There's only this one sequel, and then there's like an animated movie that they did about uh, like a, a prequel sort of what happened in Seoul at the start. But there's not like a, a mountain of them when it seems like there could be. You know, this was successful enough that they could have had eight of these out by now. So, so that kind of gives me some hope too, is that this guy is not milking it for all it's worth. And it does seem like because maybe this one was a little less well-loved, He's like pumping the brakes a little. He's like, all right, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to kill the golden goose. Like, let's just settle down and think this through. And then we, maybe we'll make another one. But he's not like pumping them out every single year, which uh, like I think the most recent of those, because obviously Freddie and Jason did that. But those Saw movies, they made like eight or ten Saw movies before they finally took a year off. And man, <laughs> it's like brutal. <laughs> but all right, Train to Busan 2. Peninsula. Let's just throw this bad boy on. Tenu, what is Mika? Jim Nunanaga took the Rigo Kaguiso. Koida Seneca Joma Kitara. All right, so there's an abrupt uh, change in sound quality for me. I'm not in Busan anymore. I'm on Jeju Island now, which uh, I was thinking in the world on a rainy night. In the world of, of the Train to Busan series, I wonder if Jeju was okay. Pretty small island, not a lot of people, all isolated. Maybe they didn't get zombified. They might be uh, just chilling. <laughs> Now listen, are there other islands off there? You, I mean, you found Jeju Island, but are there other islands off the coast that are, would be similar to this? There's definitely other islands, but this is the biggest one, like as far as one with an airport and everything. This is, as far as I know, the only one, you know, from here I think I'd have to start taking ferries and things. Man, talk about a short flight too. It was, uh, even with all the airport fees and taxes and stuff, it was like $43 Canadian, super cheap, and, uh, and the flight was less than an hour. Like you just get on the plane and get settled and you're already here. And it counts as a domestic flight once you're already in South Korea. It's pretty rad, pretty cool. And there's like palm trees and stuff. And yeah, it's just, it's nice. Yeah. So as for that film though, as for Train to Busan 2, uh, I have a feeling we just kind of won't have much to say about it. I think, uh, you know, the reviews pretty much all said it's uh, 
not as good as the first one. And uh, I mean, that's, that's true. It's not as good as the first one. <laughs> Well, it was so very typical of so many of the action movies that you see, whether they've got zombies in them or whether they've just got a bunch of bad guys with guns. Uh, it, was very, it was so similar to those. There was nothing really remarkable about it. It was okay for that kind of movie, but it certainly wasn't a remarkable movie. Like Train to Busan, to me, was, a, was definitely a, an excellent movie for zombies. And they didn't spend a whole lot of time with the drama of introducing people. Everybody was just innocent people who were victimized by this virus that was going around. Whereas the other one, we, you know, there were just specific groups of people that we had to spend a lot of time in the movie getting to know and so that we could emote with them and feel bad when bad things happened to them. Whereas the other movie was just action packed, um, just a bunch of, you know, it could be anybody who was being attacked by those guys, by those zombies. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a it's an issue with sequels in general and maybe zombie movies in particular. You know, Dawn of the Dead is an outlier, but generally sequels are are awkward. Well, remember I showed you that thing, The Last of Us, about, uh, you know, the beginning of a zombie outbreak? It really made me think of that because the same thing happened to that series where the first one there's a certain logic to what's happening. It's like, all right, you know, even if it is a bit of a cliche or a trope of it's just, okay, the world is collapsing into zombie stuff, but now what? And in The Last of Us, it's like, okay, there's someone who could be a cure, you know, pretty rote stuff, but of course we're going to deal with that. Then you get to the sequel and that obvious plot is over with. And in this case, it's okay, we saw, got to get to Busan. It's the only safe city. That's, that's the plot. So you, I guess you could go a lot of different ways with it, but it's, it's a big problem that it's not obvious anymore. <laughs> like with The Last of Us 2, it's like, it's not even about zombies anymore. It's about these weird interpersonal problems and stuff. And in this case, yeah, like you said, it's a weird action movie. But I even felt like, uh, like at first it wasn't hitting me right. Cause I'm like, what is, what's going on here? What a strange choice, what a strange film. But once you get used to that idea, I feel like we both were ready to give it the benefit of the doubt. Like, okay, if that's what this is going to be, like, try to get your way out of the ruined island of South Korea, you know, that's been quarantined. This is your chance to get out. And it's a weird action heist way to get out. But okay, let's do it. But then it just didn't, it just didn't click. It just, it's too random and silly. This movie is very silly. And, and some of the characters were just, well, as I say, that, that little girl who was always running her robot cars around, she was just uh, too cute, too cute. Like, you know, they could have, the little girl in the first show, Train to Busan, like she was an excellent little actress, that one. She didn't put on the cutesy little act and uh, aren't I sweet and none of that. She was just a normal little girl who was trying to have some time with her father. Whereas in this second one, that little girl was... Oh, so light about everything and just so cute and just overly dramatic. So that's, and, and that set the tone for the whole movie. Like instead of people just behaving like normal people would in a fear or a threat like that, they all had to have their own little action. Just so typical. It was very, very much like most action movies that you see, especially the American made ones where it's the actor that you're seeing more so than the storyline or the, it it just didn't, uh, now I wouldn't recommend that one for anybody. If you want to go see an action movie, there's much better ones, if that's your thing. Yeah, actually, when you mentioned that, that makes me think a perfect example of the, what you just said about how American, <laughs> the Americanness of it. There's this zombie movie called World War Z that was based on a novel about uh, the entire world collapsing into zombiedom. And the, the novel was about, like, here's what's happening in America. Here's what's happening in Russia. Here's what's happening here. Here's what's happening there. It dealt with the whole world. And then the big time American Hollywood movie made the whole movie about Brad Pitt and his family. It was exactly what you just said. (laughs) Like, it became a Brad Pitt movie and it sucked. And it's like, yeah, that's... But I think in this case, if I had to pinpoint where I think the biggest weakness is with Train to Busan 2, it's that it's almost like they were trying to undermine the zombies. Like, they were trying to make it not scary. Because like you were saying with the the little girl, she's just so hip and so cool, and I got my little remote control cars, and everything is so, I'm quippy. 
but then also the grandfather he's making big silly faces like oh you didn't get the batteries oh but then even the gang on the other side the the bad guys the big gang of like raiders that have lived for the last four years in a post-apocalyptic nightmare quarantine zombie filled korea instead of them holding on by their last fingers and just like desperate to survive they're just silly and goofy and having fun and it's like hey we love this mad max world we're in let's just let's just have a muppet show let's just have, put on a little i don't know it's just like nothing about it felt real or scary or threatening yeah it all just felt very silly whereas in train to busan everybody was at was ter everybody was terrified there was not one person who stood out and said you know what I can beat these guys. I'm, I'm cute. <laughs> Everybody was afraid. And that in the real world is how it would be. People would be so panic stricken and so afraid because they they wouldn't understand what was happening. They wouldn't know how to beat it. They would just freak out. And that's what they did in Train to Busan. Even the, even the stars of the show, we never saw somebody come to the surface and say, oh, I got the secret of how to do this. I can beat these guys. They did beat them, but it, half of what they were doing was by sheer luck or sheer accident. They they weren't, uh, uh, yeah, th th those characters in the second one were just, um, yeah, they, well, they rubbed me the wrong way. Didn't like any of them. <laughs> and uh, the ending, too. Remember I was saying how in the first one I thought the ending was maybe a touch dramatic with, like, the dad at the end and his uh, poetic transformation into zombie and stuff but really it, it was pretty earned though it was actually a pretty cool ending where this one man what a weird ending where it felt like it was going for that same big dramatic poetic ending but it barely even made sense like the mom is like no i can't go with you i need to stay behind why exactly i don't know to hold off some zombies maybe and then she's so well, remember. She's like, gonna Remember, she was shot in the leg, and she. So you could you could bend that a little bit and say, well, maybe she thought they had a chance to escape, but her with the leg wound, she couldn't keep up with them, so she would stay behind and save her daughters. And yeah, I can kind of buy that. <laughs> right. Which again, I guess maybe if they had stuck with that, like, okay, pick that lane and go with it. Tragic ending. But instead, yeah, she's going to kill herself, and it's like, oh, I just well, I don't know. There's no way out until she just gets inspired a bit. Like, oh, wait, someone else is coming to help me out? Yay, now I'm Captain America, now I'm fine, now everything's fine, and she just runs to the family, and it's like, oh, guess what? I was just fucking with you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, guess I'm okay. and she was moving pretty darn fast for somebody who'd been shot in the leg. <laughs> yeah, so the whole thing, very, uh, just a cartoony weirdness to this whole movie. So what I was thinking, though, because, yeah, we had a lot of nice things to say about the first one, and it's kind of a bummer to just watch the second one and just be like, well, that sucked, even though it, it did. <laughs> but I thought so we don't end on that note. Let's, let's like, tack on one more little thing, since a lot of what we were talking about last week, you know, we were talking about different cultures and how they approach zombies, you know, that uh, America approaches them with, like, mall zombies, and Korea approached them as, like, this flood like uh like the water <laughs> like the zombies are water and they're coming to flood all over you so i thought we could throw in real quick because this is just a, a little episode of an anime that's only you know 24 minutes long there's this japanese cartoon called zom 100 <laughs> that is a, a zombie cartoon and you know there's a bunch of episodes but i thought we could just watch the first one because the first one is always you know the the collapse of society that's always the best part of any zombie story and I just gave it a real quick look just to see what it was like. And it seems like this could be a good take on how Japanese people view this type of thing, where, you know, if everyone takes their society and uh, reflects it through zombies, you know, this guy is at his job that he hates and his life is just like, boah, and then zombies. <laughs> so let's uh, watch that real quick. And just so we'll have something nice to talk about or, you know, something else to discuss beyond just that Train to Busan 2 is a disappointing movie. <laughs> yeah, end on a high note. Okay. <laughs> so that was also kind of uh, silly and over the top, but a lot more interesting. It put Train to Busan 2 to shame. Yeah. <laughs> it was excellent. It was it was fast moving, interesting, exciting actually. It was good.
it was okay. Yeah, it definitely wasn't uh, subtle. The metaphor in this one is the work zombies, but and I, and I was like, even before it got really silly at the end with all the zombie stuff where it really was over the top, I was still laughing at, uh, at his work life because it was so insanely terrible. But it's sort of true though, like that's not even, it's a little exaggerated, but what I know of Japan, like the way it kind of works there is when you get a job, you generally, like it's really hard to get fired. Like you're there for life. You're, you know, that's your family now is your job. And yeah, that's the downside of it is uh, I've heard them called black companies where they take advantage of the fact that it's not easy to leave your job by, yeah, just running you ragged like that. Yeah. And the whole difference is what difference does it make? Are, are you zombified by your work or are you zombified by life? You know, there you got the two options. And in his world, it was like, hey, I'd rather be zombified by zombies than zombified by the work ethic that I'm expected to live up to. Yeah, I've also heard that even if it's not as directly terrible as that, that uh, they also have a thing in Japan where it's not so much about results, where, you know, like maybe if you, like the entrepreneurial mindset that we have in the West is if you find like a, a faster, better, more efficient way to do stuff, you get rewarded. Where in Japan, it's more... You know, you have to be seen as a team player and it's almost more important how much time you spend. You know, like you can't be the first one to leave the office. So even if you're not really getting anything done, yeah, you still have these insane work hours. And I just looked it up. I knew there was a term, but I didn't know what it was. There's a term called karoshi that means work-related death. And they say in the little article I pulled up, like that does happen all over. It's uh, it's not unique to Japan and uh, even places like Sweden that have a lot of work regulations, like there's still a lot of work-related deaths. So you can't just pin it on Japan. But the fact that Japan felt the need, they're the only ones that have a term for that, you know? That's telling that nobody else has a word just for dying, if not literally dying from stress and malnutrition and literal overwork, then yeah, like committing suicide. Like that part where the guy, he was in the, in the subway and he's looking at the little barrier and he's like, you know, if that barrier wasn't there, and that's one of the things I noticed here in South Korea, they don't have the little barriers. They've graduated to full floor to ceiling walls. Like there is no way to access the track if you're on the platform. And uh, you know, it's a safety thing, but it's also so you don't fucking <laughs> jump in front of the train. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, as far as metaphors go, zombie metaphors, like, yeah, they, they definitely nailed it on the head with that one. And obviously there's a need for that, those kind of barricades in that culture, or they wouldn't have gone to the expense of doing it. Yeah, they do a thing in Japan even. It's all so creepy, but uh, they started a thing where if you do jump onto the tracks, you get fined like a lot of money because you're obviously, you know, slowing down the trains and inconveniencing people and someone has to clean it up and, and whatever. And then you'd think, well, what do I care? I'm dead. But they pass that on to your family. So if you're already planning to kill yourself because you feel ashamed that you haven't achieved whatever you were supposed to achieve in life, you're not living up to your potential, you're, you're already dying, literally dying of shame you don't want that to be even worse. You don't want people to remember you as the person who also saddled their family with debt. And uh, like, it's just awfulness on top of awfulness, but apparently that did actually kind of help, <laughs> you know? <laughs> people found other ways. But then there's like, a, there's this forest, it's at the foot of Mount Fuji. And uh, I don't remember the real name, of course, I only know the colloquial name, which is the suicide forest. And it's this forest that's a bit famous for, that's where, because, hey, if we can't do that, and if there's nets and stuff around all the bridges and we can't jump off those, well, we can go into the forest and hang yourself or something. Like, it's just, it's so awful. But it's one of those things, like I was, uh, you know, speaking of Mount Takao we were talking about last week, when I was hiking there, I was like, hey, you know, if I just took a couple of more trains, I'm actually not that far from Mount Fuji. And then you suddenly have this awful thought of like, oh yeah, but which corner of Fuji is the suicide forest because it's probably fine I could probably go there but I would just rather not <laughs> you know but yeah just like <laughs> just so so awful and yeah this show is taking a very light 
obviously it's like, especially at the end, you can tell once the zombies hit and he's got his bucket list of stuff he's gonna do, it's not gonna be a dour show. This is gonna be an over the top, silly action show. And I don't know, it's, just, it's really, it's kind of neat that we got these two things back to back because that was the exact problem with Train to Busan 2 is that that just didn't fit, that tone didn't fit. Where in this case, it, it does seem to fit. It's like, yeah, your work life really does suck. You really do have just years of misery ahead of you. Watch the show and just have fun. Pretend it's zombie world. Yeah, and what difference does it make if your life, if your actual day-to-day -day life is so horrific yeah, might as well have some action with some zombies out trying to outrun them because that's at least more exciting and you've got a bit of a chance that you might get away. Whereas with that job, that's a dead-end job. Like, he just couldn't get away. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's really over the top where he really, uh, he wasn't even remotely concerned about the zombies. And, and they also, again, they disempower the zombies immediately that just because this guy used to play rugby, now he can fight zombies, you know? I, I have a feeling it might be a show that as it kept going, I would probably lose interest because, you know, just some guy who's frolicking about the zombie world, who knows though, maybe it's amazing. But I, I think that first episode, because I have a feeling that one's not, you know, the other ones obviously aren't gonna be that way. But the first half of that episode, yeah, if you just wanted to show somebody a vignette about, here's how bad work can be, because. <laughs> For me, the flashback was, because once I started working, I would always just work at like coffee shop, graveyard shifts, you know, just, I just didn't take jobs like that. I only had one office -y type job in, in Vancouver and I did not last long. So for me, it made me think of school, you know, school felt like that to me. I'm just like, I don't want to go back. I don't want to do this. But also that it's not like he got that job and it just was bad for two weeks. He was there for years. <laughs> like, I actually kind of thought that was cool how they really showed the hopelessness. Like, he's not getting out. Well, and how you saw scenes where they were sleeping, the, the other crew that were there were sleeping between the filing cabinets and they might get an hour or two off to go to the bar and have some drinks, but then it was back to work. And he worked two straight days without being able to go home. Yeah, like, yuck. Yeah, and all that stuff is stuff like I have heard all those anecdotes before. It's all like kind of common knowledge that that's just kind of how Japan is. Or like uh, if you're, it's one of the many reasons why, you know, as a foreigner, you can never really integrate into that society. And that is part of it is that like people, they just won't do it. You know, like if you're the guy from America who works in a Japanese company, you might stay over time once in a while or you might do it at first but everybody from the west they just won't do it eventually they're just like whatever it's six o'clock i'm done my work i'm going home but everybody else stays there till nine o'clock so you're the black sheep and you know you just won't fit in but maybe it's better not to you know at that point it's like whatever just be the pariah <laughs> at least you don't have to you know you just but if you're born there and you're in that society yeah you don't necessarily have a ton of choice kind of awful and that's the culture, obviously, that has been in their culture for centuries, because that's the whole thing behind, like, the kamikaze uh, pilots from World War II. They had no, no doubt that they were going to serve the emperor, get in those airplanes, and die when they smashed their planes into ships and that kind of stuff. So same kind of thing. It's like the, the, the job, the, the work ethic is superior to everything, to family, to your personal life, um, a little bit of time off so you can kind of regroup. Uh, that whole image that the culture is the superior being that you support, not your own individualism, whereas in Western culture, individualism is, is paramount. We do things for ourselves. We don't do it for, we don't like a job, we leave. Um, we don't like our family, our spouse, we divorce them. Um, that culture is different. The individual is like not important. They're just not, I wouldn't even say secondary. They're bottom of the loop. You do it for society, for your culture, for the emperor, whoever, but you don't question it. You just do it. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's not entirely a bad thing. Like, I mean, the kamikaze is a great example of when it is a bad thing, you know, that that's a uh, I saw a guy once talking about Shinto religion and that idea that they used to think the emperor was God. 
And he's like, don't worry, like, we don't believe that anymore because we know, I know that's scary that we even were that way. Like, don't worry, we don't think that's true anymore. But then the good side of it is like after the war, when uh, I was reading a book about the history of Sony and just how desperately poor Japan was in the 50s and how terrible everything was. But then they, you know, battened down the hatches and pulled, pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. You know, like all that stuff America talks about, about like, you know, like just... Uh, <laughs> heave ho and work hard. They really did that. You know, everybody scrimped and everybody saved and everybody worked hard for decades. And by the time they got to the eighties, they were on top of the world. And there's not a lot of cultures that would be able to do that, to pull yourself from the bottom to the top. But the, the way they were able to do that is through stuff like, like what we saw in that cartoon. And yeah, and it's just, it's uh, so, I mean, yeah, it's one of those things that it would be weird to just blanketly criticize it when it did do a lot of good. I'm just glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> you know, that's I guess all I can really say about it.